Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I just love coming to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. It's where I get all my fine woodworking tools and a great woodworking education. Let me show you what we've got on the big show today. This time on the Highland Woodworker. Three-dimensional show home, 150 years ago, all by hand, no power tools, and all raw lumber. The captivating story about a master woodworker, his family, and his showcase home caught in the middle of one of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War. And we were invited inside this work of art. This is going to create a much better roadmap. Fine Woodworking Magazine's Mike Pekovich has the finer points of laying out dovetails. This tip will surely stick with you. The challenge is trying to understand how the first person did it. How do you make it? Master woodworker, conservator, and restorer Lynn Reinhardt gives us a closer look at how he makes old family treasures new again. These stories and more this time on the Highland Woodworker. J.T. Thompson. How are you, sir? Welcome. Welcome oh. to Franklin. Glad to have you. This is just a marvelous place, so full of woodworking history. Oh, it's, it's amazing. Johann Ebert Lotz, the master woodworker, pulls out of Nashville and moves here in 1855, purchases this property, and it takes three years to build this home. And at first blush, it looks like a white plank structure. But let's, let's zoom in and look at some very key things for him. The master woodworker from Germany, 20 years in the making, this is, the mo this is the modern day version of, of the show home in terms of him. So this was his showcase. Yes, you see the, the flowers, the top of every column, the acorn finials that run the entire roof line, kind of hidden by the magnolia, magnolia branches. You have this wonderful acanthus leaf scroll top pediment. And I encourage all the guests that come here for tours, look at the carving above every window because you'll quickly see that the first floor design is totally different from the second. He's trying to show clients. Sir, ma'am, if you don't like design A, I'm happy to do design B. Three-dimensional show home, 150 years ago, all by hand, no power tools, and all raw lumber. Come on in. Welcome to Lotes House. Glad to have you. Hey, this is great. Now, you were telling me about the staircase. Yes, this, this, this is Johann Alberts. This is his, his masterpiece. In, in, in learning about him and researching the guild system of Europe, the woodworking guild, the Car carpenter guild, the furniture making guild, mid 19th century, as an apprentice, he would have been schooled in his reading, his writing, writing his arithmetic. He would have been uh, clothed, fed his tools. But all the work he produces at that point does not belong to him. Ten years in, Johann Albert Lotz earns this, the title journeyman which means two things for him. First, he may be paid for his work, and secondly, he can marry. And then the last test one takes at this point in time in the 19th century, moving from journeyman to master is you must design and then you must build a staircase. It's so critically important because in our construction methods today, uh, homes are modular. Every home in the 19th century, all built independently. So every staircase will be totally different. And so when you walk in this home and you see this, this is the crowning glory for his home because this is what he has spent time, energy, and effort to earn master woodworking status. Well, it's cantilevered. Yes, freestanding, cantilevered, free-forming wraparound. The architectural essence of this piece blows people away, but the woodworkers who come and say, JT, the compound bend and twist would be very difficult to accomplish today with all of our technology, but to do this all by hand, mid 19th century, 1855, 56, 57, truly is remarkable. He is a master, master woodworker. Well, it's astounding, with no power to No, and all, yes, and, and just the arm, yes, and this. The Newell Post. The Newell Post. Uh, he called Music City, Music City long before it was the Music City we know today in terms of he makes guitars, fiddles, banjos. The true love of this man, other than his bride, his family, is to make grand pianos. And this is the leg of one of his grand pianos that he'll actually flip it over and he uses this massive leg to stabilize this beautiful black walnut wraparound staircase. And then taking that a bit further, things obviously have changed, but, but decorum, medallion here, his name and date carved 1858. That's the year he finishes the home. 
bragging would have to say a single solitary word about it. Uh, somebody walks in the door just like we did. They see this medallion and, he, and he's communicated instantly to them. I have paid off my home. I have paid off my property. They show you they have some money in the bank. They don't talk about the fact they have cash in their well, pockets. Well, it's a decorated post, yes. and that has significance. Very much so. It's, it's saying that the house has been paid off. The medallion here, and also what I refer to, uh, and likely not the right woodworking term, but this white and fancy full carving decorating the piece. Again, the clear indication the house has been paid for. Showing, not talking. And when it comes to the bank, half mile the north, downtown Franklin in 1858, there's no need for this man to saddle up the horse, walk downtown, or get in that wagon to go to the bank because he will put his safety deposit box. I call that the very first hide a safe, if you will. The family in California has been so instrumental in sharing tools. And these are just a few of what we have that he will actually take to California with him when he leaves Franklin in the late summer of 1869. But these are, these are the man's. Squares, just as they make them today. Uh, just beautiful. Uh, I wonder, they've got his L on there. Yes. Uh, this is just <laughs> marvelous to hold these, because measuring and marking tools are some of the most personal. Sure. To, and so he, this is a, a level. Yes, sir. Uh, and it's still got the bubble inside. How about that? With some... Uh, air that came pre-Civil War. Price, priceless in more ways than one for us. This, uh, undoubtedly, was the simple wedge that okay. he used for splitting. Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, it's covered, I'm sure a blacksmith made this or he made it himself uh, so that the blows would not split out right. his, his wedge. And, uh, of course, it's, it's pitted and, and, and rusted to coming apart here. But... With these basic tools, he could start over again. And I understand that yes. he grabbed these tools and on a fateful day uh, where he had to leave the house yes, for the, and he started out across the street to, uh, to the Carter house. To the Carter house where he could survive a battle, it will tell you about. He, he, he makes the delineation, the, the, he determines, frankly, that late November 3064, the battle starts at four. In, 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 in my strong belief, it, he makes the determination we have to get out of this wooden house very late. Mom, three children all in the age of nine, um, when they leave this home, they actually go toward the battle and they're seeking cover. They're seeking coverage. The closest place to get safe is the Carter House, 110 steps across the street. And by going toward the Carter House, they're actually going toward the battle as opposed to away the battle. And, and we know based on his diary that when he leaves, he picks up his baby with one arm, two, year old, two and a half year old Augustus, he picks up his toolbox in the other. He Amazing. Made, he had to take his baby in one arm, that toolbox. And so if I survive this, at least I'll have the tools to start life yeah, over This is again. the future. Correct, in more yeah. ways than one. Uh -huh. And this is the piece that moves me. Th this whole family story moves me. When Mr. Lotes, Please, Franklin, late summer of 1869, he will take this piece of furniture with him in the covered wagon all the way to San Jose, California. He hand carves this magnificent table behind the home in his woodworking shop before the war takes place. It will survive the hideous battle inside the home. And as a woodworker and everybody who's watching, when you see this piece and really realize what this piece is, you'll be amazed. Solid black walnut and it's crotch grained at the top. Right, it's book matched. It's book, book matched, mm -hmm. meaning simply put, he takes that log, splits it down the middle, and matches it grain for grain. And again, not the woodworker, but I am told that to accomplish this today with tools and computers, difficult to do, but by hand, 159 years ago, truly remarkable. Upon, upon closer inspection, you have the very formal C and S scroll legs, uh, the stylized dolphin head feet, you see this incredible Grecian urn that he hand carves and turns underneath. It's beautiful. Just really a, a wonderful piece. So JT, like Paul Harvey said, tell us the rest the of the story. The rest of the story. Well, there's always the rest of the story. And, and one more thing I just gotta, gotta show you. He comes back to the house the next day. It's, it's filled with dead and dying from both sides. 
and he's devastated to see that the south wall of the home is down, the roof has come crashing down, that magnificent staircase is on the floor, but this is what greets him. Besides the dead and wounded from both sides, you see the cannonball indention here. Yeah. Cannonballs are raining down through this man's home. They go through the roof, they go to the ceiling. This is where they come to rest. One here, one over here in the doorway. But to give your viewers an idea, this is actually a six pound solid shot Confederate cannonball. It's one of a dozen that was dug up a fire yard 15 years ago. And we're gonna let you hold it, but I tell folks it's deceptively heavy. It is. It is a toe breaker if you drop it. And if you like to grocery shop, it will make you appreciate that next four or five pound bag of sugar that you pick up in your local grocery yeah, store. So there were, there were two types of rounds. Uh, yeah, uh, there was this to pulverize and knock down. Yes, uh, whatever. exactly. And then there's there's what's called a 10 inch mortar shell. And we're going to let you hold that one, Chuck. But this is actually about 300 pounds. And this will explode and break apart and send shrapnel flying. But bottom line, the bottom line... It's not fun when anything like this is coming at you, but this is what greets him the next day. And, and again, to stress for Loach, three years to build, no slaves or slave labor. He does it all by himself. It will take the man four years to repair this wooden home once the bloody battle of Franklin is over. Now, this battle of Franklin was a huge battle. There were lots and lots of, tell me about the Battle of Franklin. It's often overlooked. It's often overlooked. It's very late in the war. There's no photographs. Ten thousand American casualties in five hours. And people from all over the world come to Franklin to hear these amazing stories. And when you say 10,000 American casualties, how do you grasp that with the cars going up and down the highway today? This helps everybody understand. What happens in Franklin, basically the equivalent of three days of 9-11, back to back to back. Franklin will witness that carnage in five short hours, right where we stand today. More casualties than Normandy, is that right? Yes, more American soldiers fight and die in Franklin on November 30, 1864 than do taking Omaha Beach. More American generals die here, six, than any battle in American history. What a story. Wherever you live, find out about the history and find out about the history of your local woodwork. Ed Sit, it looks like we have a good book in the toolbox today. This is quite the volume here. Um, Paul Sellers has an amazing following and he has reignited traditional hand tool woodworking, I think probably worldwide you could say. And he has 480 pages here of soup to nuts, everything you could possibly want to know about working with hand tools in a shop for building is in this book. That sounds great because everybody needs a reference whether you're just starting out or whether you've been working a long time in wood. Right, well, Paul Sellers, I'd, if I had one word to describe him, I think it would be prolific. He's a prolific woodworker, prolific educator, uh, he, filmmaker, he's made DVDs, he's author and writing books, and he just is everything hand tools. Coming up. You can hit your line exactly, but if your saw kerf is on the wrong side, you're sort of building in gaps to the joint before you even get started. Mike Pekovich has the finer points of laying out dovetails. See how a little blue tape cuts out all the guesswork. There was a slot and it was missing the knob. From hidden drawers to complete chair restorations, a moment with master woodworker and conservator Lynn Reinhardt. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. I'm just an average down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of one to 10, I'm probably about a five. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here. And I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. Are your tools Tormac sharp? Tormac, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormac, sharpening innovation. For 35 years, Lee has manufactured the world's best joinery jigs. From our award-winning dovetail jigs and mortise and tenon jigs, to newer innovations like router table jigs. Easily add strong, beautiful joinery to your woodworking pieces, like half-blind dovetails, box joints, mortise and tenon joints, and through dovetails. Lee, simply the easiest and most versatile router joinery jigs. 
Whiteside Machine Company has been in business for over 30 years providing customers with quality American-made router bits. Fine Woodworking Magazine has declared Whiteside router bits best overall and best value when compared against 17 other brands. No matter the router application, they have the type and profile of carbide router bit you need. When you put a white side router bit to work in your shop, it is guaranteed to make you smile. <laughs> Woodworkers count on American-made forest saw blades for smooth, quiet cuts every time without splintering, scratching, or tear outs. The famous Woodworker 2 is the all-purpose combination blade. But for special cuts, Woodworker 2s are available for cutting dovetails, for flat bottom joinery. A 30 tooth blade is perfect for ripping, a 48 tooth blade for superior cross cuts, and a finger joint blade set. There is a perfect far as Woodworker 2 for every table saw cut. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for more than 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year round ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, just look in their catalog or go to highlandwoodworking.com. Mike, I know you're proud of your proud dovetails, <laughs> and uh, they should be celebrated. I tell you, every time I start, it's uh, it, it's probably the layout, how I begin. I think it's so important how you end up. Can can you show me how you do it? That you're exactly right. Um, I have a lot of dovetails uh, in my work, and when I teach, I'm often teaching folks how to cut dovetails. It's one of those really intimidating things about woodworking, but it's not that tough. And to your point, while a lot of people may be kind of freaked out about sawing and using a handsaw, really it's pretty easy to cut to a line. But if your lines aren't where you need them to be, that's where you're gonna run into trouble. So layout is the key. And I've got some tips that I've sort of come up with over the course of trying to teach this for a couple few years now that really help students out. In fact, I use them myself in the shop and maybe they'll help you out as well. All right, I'm game. Cool. So the first thing I do is I like to throw some blue tape on my end grain. I work a lot in white oak, and I find that little knife line on end grain can Especially be, in quarter sawn, you'd never yeah, find it. Yeah, can be really tough to see. Um, and I found that just by scribing through blue tape and peeling away the, the tape in the waste areas, it just lets me see exactly where I'm going. So first things first, this is going to create a much better roadmap. And the better you see your line, the more confident you are about getting your saw right up next to it. If I'm having to try to guess between a scribe line and a growth ring, I'm going to err on the side of caution. And I find that folks um, create more gaps and dovetails when they're fitting than when they're sawing. So if you're too cautious and conservative and you start by sawing too far away from your line, you're just making problems for yourself. So with this in place, the next thing to the challenge is we've got to hold these pieces together in a way that this isn't slipping and sliding around while we mark those lines. I usually get my mother-in-law to come out and well, hold them for me. Unfortunately, mine doesn't live too nearby. So um, I came up with this little block where it's just a square piece of stock and I glued on a little tab on there. And what that allows me to do is it allows me to register the block to the top of my workpiece. And I just pinch those together while I slide that into my vise. And then I can flip it. And it, I use it to support 
the, the back end of my workpiece. And in doing so, I can really pressure right between the two to get a lot of leverage, which really holds the stock really soundly in place for scribing, so nothing's going anywhere. So that's taken care of, but um, the next thing is to get this in the exact orientation. We've got to get three things right here, or we're going to run into trouble. Number one, we have to be um, front to back. We have to get this aligned up because the walls of our tails are angled. So if this board is too far out, they're going to be too loose. And if it's too far in, they're going to be too tight. So problems either way. Secondly, we want to be aligned side to side so we don't have these stair steps on our drawer parts or case parts. And third, we want to make sure we're aligned sort of rotationally, because otherwise we're going to introduce some really twist in, in our drawer parts or case parts. We're either going to have to plane those flat or we're going to end up with some wonky parts to deal with later. So three things to deal with. What I came up with is just dirt simple. It's a piece of quarter inch MDF. And I cut a slot in a piece of pine and I glued it to one edge. When I was gluing it, I used my square to make sure that I'm at 90 degrees and I left it long so a little tab sticks out. What I can do now is clamp this to the underside and I'll flip it over and I can slide it up until this little guide is aligned with my baseline. And I can hold it in place with the spring clamp on the other side. Now it's just sort of <clears throat> just lightly held in place. So I want to pinch the two together. And what I want to do is I can bring my workpiece forward until the guide contacts that base. And then I can slide it until this little tab lines up with the side of the piece. Front to back, I'm good. Rotationally, I'm good. And side to side, I'm good. Very simple. Really, really simple. So the next step is easy. I can hold that in place. Knife through my tape. Finally, I can peel away the tape in the waste areas because the biggest challenge when you're first cutting dovetails, as you know, is sawing on the right side of the line. Um, you can hit your line exactly, but if your saw kerf is on the wrong side, you're sort of building in gaps to the joint before you even get started. And what I like about the tape is not only does it tell me exactly where my scribe line is, it also tells me, really intuitively, where to saw. Just don't saw into your tape and you're going to be in good shape. And that joint is going to come together perfectly. I might even be able to do that. <laughs> I guarantee Thank you so you much, Mike. My pleasure. Still ahead. This is probably, you know, 150 years old plus, and it's held together just fine. Bringing the past back to life. A moment with Lynn Reinhardt is coming up. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. What is quality? Is it quick? Forgettable? Easy? No, it isn't quick or easy. It isn't forgettable. Quality takes work. It takes time. Quality lasts. And it starts at Bell Forest, a leading global supplier of figured and exotic woods. Order online at bellforestproducts.com. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading bandsaws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power Tools.
Moment with a Master is brought to you by Highland Woodworking. Fine tools since 1978. Let Highland's legendary wood slicer resaw blade help make it easy for you to get great results sawing thick lumber into thinner boards. The wood slicer is designed to cut much faster, smoother, and quieter than ordinary bandsaw blades. You'll be amazed at how smooth a surface you'll get with a wood slicer. Its variable tooth pattern greatly reduces noise and vibration. Order a wood slicer from Highland Woodworking for your bandsaw today. Now sit back and be inspired with our moment with a master. So I will you know, mix up some color to repair that spot right there. This is just another typical day in Lynn Reinhardt's workshop. <laughs> Not only does he craft incredible furniture pieces, he restores family treasures that have been passed down from generation to generation, like this amazing French chest. We have a lot going on with the marquetry work. Over the years, you can actually see uh, some of the things, how it was done in the past. You know, now we're all hung up on dovetails. It's like dovetail, dovetails. Um, everybody's talking dovetails, but yet in the old days, here's just a drawer and a beautiful piece that there's no dovetails. It's just nailed together. Um, the bottom is nailed on, and this is probably you know, 150 years old plus, and it's held together just fine. Solid wood bottom, um, and just the back is dadoed in. Here's a knot on the side. You know, if somebody was to make a drawer today, would you leave a knot at the top of the drawer? So you really have to, uh, in your work, you have to understand the bones of the furniture. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. and have an idea or a scheme about how much restoration is really right. necessary. You know, and then the challenge really becomes is that let's say there's a piece that's missing a side or, or back or whatever, how do you find the wood for that? You know, how do you find the part for that? Very difficult, you know. So I think what makes any good restoration um, person or conservation is their resources to be able to recreate something. The veneer work uh, as it comes in is, is not perfect. Yeah. And uh, so your, your job there is to, I guess, replace right. just special pieces. Right. You know, and just not make it look too perfect. It has to look, you know, um, correct for the piece. It's a challenge. Every piece is a challenge and every, you know, day is a challenge because you have to be good at a lot of things from carving to turning to finishing to making pieces, whatever, whatever it takes. You know, the challenge is really trying to understand how the first person did it. How do you make it? How do you make it? What tools did he have? What, what were available at that time? And then to the best of your ability to recreate that again. So you also have to understand the history of furniture. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you do a lot of research. I yeah. think. Um, a lot of folks ask me, is like, how did you learn how to do what you do? And it's books. It's, it's really, it's reading all the time. Um, I don't watch much TV, um, and it's really looking for the resources, um, primarily in print, um, that are historical references. They're out there, you just have to find them. Early on, Lynn spent a lot of time with veneer work and repair. Through that, he really developed a masterful understanding of how finishes work. This came pretty naturally, since prior to opening Reinhardt Restorations, Lynn had a 17-year career as a pharmacist. But alas, he went back to his roots. Yeah, my, I grew up um, in Buffalo, New York, and my dad was an architect. And so there were always tradespeople in our house, um, from the masons to the carpenters to the cabinet makers. And it was not unusual that they'd be around the dinner table or the kitchen table, or even when I would go to visit my dad, um, that they would be in his office. So, um, you know, it was uh, very interesting to me to see how things were built uh, from the planning stage all the way to watching the buildings go up. So you'd go out to the job with your dad yeah, sometimes? Yeah, that was one of my first, you know, was a non-paying job for sure. 
Yeah. yeah, he'd I'd hold the tape and he'd say, go run to the corner, you know, and I'd go run to the corner, you know, and my other brother would run to the other corner and shout out the number and my dad would, you know, take the measurements, so. Lynn, this piece looks like it split along here. Yeah. Well, you know, Chuck, one of my, uh, one of my favorite things to see is when a piece comes in and I love hidden compartments, you know. Sometimes, you know, we look at a piece and we don't even realize that they're there. And when this one first came in, you know, I opened the lid and I saw this little shelf area, and I said, well, why is there a shelf area there? And I looked, and then I came around this side, and I was like, well, yeah, just like we said, looks like it split. And I said, I wonder if there's a drawer there. Well, lo and behold, when I came down below, there was a slot, and it was missing the knob. Oh. So I turned an ebony knob to make it so that the drawer comes open. Well, Lynn, do you have a favorite piece out of all the work you've done? Yeah. You know, Chuck, I would say my favorite piece, I can't say one piece, I would say pieces are the ones that really mean something to the family. When I get the phone call and they say, this was my aunt's or was my grandmother's or was in the family or I remember this piece. And they bring them to me and they're in pieces, um, whether it might be the missing finial or... Um, a big ring on the top or alligator finish or whatever and I'm able to restore them to the and then bring them back to the client and when I'm delivering them they get emotional you know and it's an emotional response that a lot of people have um, to a lot of their items their family heirlooms and just knowing that I was part of that are really my favorites. I do a lot of chairs. Is it, you know, um, I always tell folks that quality chair will always break at the glue joint before it will break at the wood joint. Um, so typically about every 50 to 60, 70 years or so that a chair would need to be re-glued. And as a you know, furniture conservationist, what's very frustrating is that I see a lot of chairs that Gorilla Glue and all kind of crazy glues and putties and things people jam into the joints and they don't work. Really, the chair needs to be exploded, all the old glue taken out, the dowels or the joints and tenons repaired, um, and then re-glued and put back together. So this is an example of a chair that was disassembled, um, all the joints cleaned out, and then re-glued and put back together again. Because you can't glue to glue. Right. And we just right. keep trying to do That's that. That's right. Yes. Right. It just, uh, oftentimes a person just doesn't want to take the time to, you know, take the chair apart and do it the right way. But what's this nice is here we got a brass inlay, um, and the brass inlay on this one would need to be re uh, replaced here. But it's wonderful inlay and carving. Um, and what's really nice about this chair, too, is that, you know, at first you look at the, uh, the detail and the beading, you know, this is all hand beaded. And you can look and see how it's wider here as it goes up the back, how it gets more narrow. So you can't do that with a machine. That's all done by hand, typically probably with a scratch stock. That's how that was done. And it's got some uh, history yeah. of infestation. Yep, yeah. um, very typical, I'll see uh, insect infestation. And the real you know, trick is to tell if it's active or not. And it just comes with a, you know, how a chair might have been stored or where it was. And I guess the, the seat uh, sits on this button here right. to keep it in alignment. Right, so it's a seat, a pin seat, so there'll be an upholstered seat that will just mm -hmm. set inside this cavity right inside here uh, as well. Well, this is a beauty here. One yeah. of my favorite designs. Yeah, you know, oh, now over almost 20 years I've seen and glued a lot of chairs and these, in my opinion, are probably the best chairs I have worked on um, in my career so far. It was this foot over here that um, actually had in insect infestation and about a third of that was missing. And I'll take it, clean it out, um, glue on a new piece of wood and then recarve on top of there. So there's an example of, you have to be good at a lot of things. But here also on this chair, we can see that it was um, repaired at some point, because these are, it's pegged here. That was not original. Um, 
which actually made it very difficult to take this leg out, that it was pinned. So and that leg probably got loose at some point in its history, and whoever decided to try to fix it, instead of taking it all apart, just pinned it. So you had to drive the, uh, the drawbore peg out. Yes. Uh, was it glued also? Yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, well, you've done so, I guess, with, without uh, busting up this, this little corner here. Yeah, that, that it's very hard. Very hard. Very Beautiful hard job. I think within every community in any country, there's always the guy or the gal that people say, I remember when that person was around because he was the one that could fix my furniture or knew everyone. He was well respected within the community um, from his beliefs, honesty. He was a trusted member of the community and he was essential to the community too because without you know, that individual, um, there would be a hole. And I think within my community, that's how I would want to be remembered. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. That's all the time we have for the show today. But check us out on social media and come back to see us next time on the Highland Woodworker.